University. This is also part of a kind of collaboration that's been uh, set up between Yale and, and UCL, which started in the uh, medical sciences and is now being rolled out, we are told, to uh, the humanities and social sciences, uh, amongst other things. So, so uh, we're here to, to discuss um, uh, Sailor's uh, recent book, Dignity and Adversity, Human Rights in, in Troubled Times. And uh, Sailor's going to, to, to kick off with some sort of introductory remarks, then we'll have open it up to, to uh, questions from the floor. And then, then we're going to discuss in depth a number of, of, of chapters and, and the, the uh, sort of way it's going to be is there'll be a uh, presentation of, uh, by, by uh, uh, someone on, on, on each chapter, followed by a brief response from Sailor, and then again open up to um, general discussion. So, uh, just one little bit of, of uh, information. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the University of London headquarters here, also generally used as, uh, in all films as the headquarters of whatever totalitarian regime <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, well, the is occupying uh, <laughs> London at, at the time, from Richard III, a great film, uh, to, to uh, in, in C.J. Sampson's Dominion, where uh, it's the German <laughs> embassy. Um, so, uh, anyway... Uh, but they don't seem to be on Udo Rome here in, in the University of London. Um, so instead, it's UOL conferences for the Wi-Fi, and the um, today's password is A V E O F R, all lowercase. Avio. F yeah. Oh yeah. Good idea. If I have a pen. Oh yeah. Okay, so, Sayla, please. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, could you just open it before I spill everything? Well, let me uh, begin this morning by uh, thanking Professor Bellamy and his colleagues and uh, students for organizing uh, this uh, event. and. Uh, uh, UCL Yale Cooperative uh, Venture around European Studies. Uh, this is a pleasure and an um, uh, honor uh, to have this uh, entire day dedicated to a discussion of these uh, themes. I want to begin this morning by um, uh, specifying uh, what I would call the political conceptual moment in which these uh, essays were uh, composed between 2002 and 2009. Uh, this uh, moment was characterized by the rise of the security state, the spread of the war on terror, uh, the use and abuse of the language of the protection of human rights in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq, both in the hands of American neoconservatives and also in more confused fashion among uh, liberals um, and with the discourse of the emergent practice of humanitarian intervention and R2P responsibility to protect. Now this uh, volatile context um, of the previous decade uh, gave rise um, to a, a left uh, critique that identified the universal language of human rights with either being an ideological subterfuge of a bid for empire, namely the spread of neo-colonial uh, or neoliberal markets or American hegemony, or uh, some other commentators argued that the language of human rights was being instrumentalized um, to perpetuate a world emergency situation as many of you are aware, Carl Schmitt became the theorist of the day, and uh, the global war on terror morphed into a so-called war on Islamic fundamentalism. 
Uh, we did this volatile context. Uh, we were also facing a situation of what I like to call liberal timidity and a retreat from the seeming ethnocentrism and troubled universalism of uh, the human rights discourse. Uh, this was already apparent in the preceding decade in 1999 with uh, John Rawls's uh, very famous attempt in the law of uh, peoples to restrict human rights to what he called a minimal standard for, of well-ordered political institutions for all peoples. And as is also well known, this minimal standard of well-ordered political institutions for all peoples was much less uh, robust than the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other bills of rights as far as <coughs> women's rights, rights of religious minorities, and even the right of democratic self-determination is concerned. Uh, this turning away from Kantian cosmopolitanism on the part of the most important uh, neo-Kantian political philosopher um, of the preceding century was uh, in also part of the uh, liberal sentiment of uh, uh, confusion and consternation about the proper universalism of human rights um, discourse. So this is largely the political philosophical context against which I try to salvage the project of cosmopolitanism. I name uh, one of the essays in the volume, Beyond Interventionism and Indifference. I should also add maybe as code words, Beyond Left Cynicism and Neoconservative Imperialist Hegemonic Aspirations. This is the uh, a conceptual space into which I'm entering, in which I'm trying to intervene. Uh, let me then just say um, a few uh, words about some of the key general uh, problems and um, issues in the book. I'm sure that we will have time to get into a more in-depth conversation about them as the day progresses. The first is uh, the term cosmopolitanism. As uh, you will recall, I named the introduction Cosmopolitanism Without Illusions. Um, a colleague of mine once uh, said, well, shortly before I was finishing the book, he said, isn't this term a tired term? <laughs> I've thought about this. <laughs> um, but uh, there is um, uh, something about uh, the history of the term that I try to retrieve um, in uh, uh, the book uh, while avoiding uh, what I call the false totalization that may be implicit behind the project of cosmopolitanism and this notion of blocking false totalization, which is really inspired by an Adorno understanding of how we can deploy universalism and yet at the same time block its false um, ambitions and assumptions is quite crucial. Um, for me, the critical turning point in the uh, history of cosmopolitanism, which as we know we owe to ancient Greek philosophy, comes with the special twist that Kant gives to this uh, term in 1795 with his concept of world citizenship. I think this concept of world citizenship, Weltbürgerschaft, all of a sudden uh, changes and resituates uh, many of the themes that were associated with cosmopolitanism throughout uh, ancient history, such as uh, non-identification with a particular polis, criticism uh, of the practices of the various uh, um, uh, um, uh, politeia, and the sense of uh, there being a kind of rational order of the cosmos to which uh, the Stoics as well as the Cynics in some measure appeal. Now, by using the term uh, world citizenship, and where Kant argues in his famous third article of Perpetual Peace when he says, uh, world citizenship shall be um, uh, confined to conditions of universal hospitality, uh, Kant opens up a domain of law. And in the now dual German sense of the term Recht, which is always difficult in English because it means both individual rights, but it also means law. And it, he opens up this domain of right, law, in subjective and objective rights, 
beyond um, uh, domestic law and also beyond international law understood in which Jeremy Bentham formulated it, namely as law among states. For Kant, uh, use cosmopoliticum uh, is relations of right and law between individuals and states among peoples in non-state situations and all sorts of non-state actors and other societal and commercial companies. Now, of course, um, this uh, uh, term that Kant gives to the uh, term is very much bound up with the Enlightenment European expansion onto other parts of the world. And if you read uh, carefully uh, the commentary that Kant himself gives um, in this text of uh, the term hospitality, he's very aware of the fact that hospitality can be used and abused by um, Western European powers uh, in the sense of forcing uh, the opening up of non-European lands to, uh, to contact. This is something that we may want to explore in the course of the afternoon, but there is a rich historical uh, contextuality uh, behind Kant's understanding, which I think uh, shows the problematic uh, genesis of the term cosmopolitanism in the modern period, which is on the one hand aspiring to what you know, Kant calls human contact, but at the same time is very much aware uh, that this is uh, implicated in uneven um, uh, power, uh, power uh, relations. And foremost in Kant's mind is the attempt, for example, of the Chinese to resist uh, Western colonialism by not opening up their land, and at the same time his insistence on this good. So in invoking you know, this uh, uh, concept, I'm very much aware of its own problematic history. But I think it is precisely uh, this thin line between, um, if you wish, between universalization and ethnocentrism, between universalism and imperialism that one needs to um, explore. Systematically, um, the philosophical burden of my argument begins in chapter four. So I don't know if Laura Valentini, is she here? Oh, I look forward to your commentary <laughs> later this uh, morning because I think in some ways uh, this is one of the most difficult um, uh, chapters. Um, in uh, chapter four called Another Universalism, I address uh, the question of the uh, uh, philosophical um, strategy for justifying universalism what we understand by it, what we mean by it, particularly of how we can converse about universalism uh, beyond uh, the problematicity of you know, essentialism or uh, a kind of limited uh, ethnocentrism. And I make some technical distinctions here among essentialist universalism, justificatory universal and moral versus juridical universalism. I will not explore all the details you know, in this opening comments, uh, but I very much look forward to this um, initial discussion. My general goal is to try to find a vision for the justification of human rights that is non-essentialist, non-reductionist, but deeply implicated in the democratic uh, project. Some of my questions are, do justificatory universalism and the communicative vision of the person uh, imply or compel us to accept a definitive list of human rights? What is the relationship between an account of human rights, uh, such as I give, and the variety of human rights codified in various legal documents across uh, political uh, regimes? These are some of the questions then, which run through the following chapters like a red uh, thread. One of the central concepts um, in this work, and uh, one that has dominated my work for the last 10 years, is that is democratic iterations. Uh, democratic iterations is a term I have used to describe how the unity and diversity of human rights is enacted in the strong and weak public spheres of civil society, in courts and legislatures, as well as by social movements, civil society actors, transnational organizations, and um, 
to life. Um, I claim that um, uh, democratic iterations, sometimes, not always, uh, result in uh, jurist generativity, another crucial content. By uh, jurist generativity, I understand uh, the law's capacity to create a universe of meaning uh, that law cannot control. And this uncontrolled character of meaning destabilizes power and permits new political actors to claim rights for themselves, thus developing new forms of political and legal uh, subjectivity. So what I'm interested in then is uh, the way uh, in which um, uh, the language of rights and law can enable uh, democratic um, iterations in a threefold fashion by permitting new uh, actors uh, to enter the public political sphere of claim making by enabling them to alter and transform uh, the vocabulary of public claim uh, making and by anticipating forms of justice uh, to come uh, through their new uh, politics. The political and moral intuitions guiding me here had been first formed in the women's movements um, and uh, here, which transformed for the first time private shame into public uh, claims, uh, the very idea of finding a public vocabulary uh, for um, uh, rape, sexual abuse, this transformation that we first saw in the women's movement. Uh, the way the movement expanded our concept of the public as well as the very vocabulary of public claim making and the way it enabled new groups of actors to enter the public um, arena. In many chapters of uh, the book, I look now at transnational or the transnationalization of movements for women's rights and in particular, as you know, over a number of um, works I have looked at the uh, controversy about the uh, uh, hijab and you know women uh, wearing the uh, the scarf. So let me try to um, uh, stress um, uh, again that democratic iterations involve complex processes of public argument, deliberation, and exchange through which universalist rights claims are contexted and contextualized, invoked, and revoked. But is this concept an empirical one or a normative one? What is the relationship of democratic iterations to discourses of normative justification? And second, uh, this model of democratic iterations within and across borders seems to entail a very strong model of democratic authorship in the sense of uh, a people collectively um, being the subject, not only the object of the laws, but also being able to claim uh, authorship for them. But this concept of democratic authorship seems to presuppose a territorially bounded uh, nation state. So let me begin by uh, addressing the second problem first, and then I'll come to this uh, dualism of democratic iterations uh, between empirical and normative um, normative ambitions, and this will be Richard's commentary this afternoon on Twilight of Sovereignty. Uh, in um, some of the essays in this volume, I explored uh, the transformation of uh, sovereignty and the remaking of the boundaries of the demos, which is, uh, which is crucial to the cosmopolitan project uh, uh, today. But how can um, the concept of democratic authorship be made sense of within this uh, changing um, uh, 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 context. I argue now um, in um, uh, the essay called Transformations of Sovereignty that the concept of sovereignty ambiguously refers to two moments in the foundations of the modern state, and that the history of modern political thought since Thomas Hobbes can plausibly be told as a negotiation of these two understandings of sovereignty. First, sovereignty means the capacity of a public body, in the case of the modern nation state, uh, since Baudin and Hobbes, to act as the final and invisible, indivisible seat of authority, 
with the jurisdiction to yield monopoly over the means of violence, to recall Max Weber's famous um, uh, phrase. But sovereignty also means, particularly since the French Revolution, popular sovereignty, that is the idea that people are subjects and objects of the law, or the makers as well as the obeyers of the law, um, which uh, the most uh, cogent statement of which remains, of course, Rousseau's du contrat social. In this sense, popular sovereignty involves representative institutions, the separations of powers, and the guarantee not only of liberty and equality, but increasingly of the equal value of liberty of each. So my question then is, how does the new configuration of state sovereignty influence popular sovereignty? Which political options are becoming possible? Which are blocked? In other words, um, uh, I, I take it uh, to be an empirical observation, a social political observation, that in effect, and this is, this is really not uh, new, that uh, the capacities of the modern state have changed so radically uh, in the uh, last um, a, a half century uh, in particular that the um, configuration of state sovereignty, such as we have seen with uh, uh, somewhat limping, but uh, I, I think necessary project of the European Union, and I, I believe there will be others, but this is a further conversation, that this reconfiguration of state sovereignty is a process that will speed up, that will continue to take place, uh, which does not mean that we will not have a kind of also reassertions of territorial uh, uh, sovereignty and more hegemonial bits uh, for power. But by and large, uh, I believe that we are caught not only in the reconfiguration of sovereignty, but also what I call the reconstitutions of citizenship. And uh, this uh, is a more global uh, phenomenon than uh, meets uh, the eye. Um, uh, we are moving away from citizenship increasingly as national membership towards a citizenship of residency which strengthens the multiple ties to locality, to the region, and to transnational uh, institutions. The crucial question here is uh, this. Um, in my view, cosmopolitan norms enhance the project of popular sovereignty while also prying open the black box of state sovereignty. They challenge the prerogative of the state to be the highest authority, dispensing justice over all that is living and dead within certain territorial uh, boundaries. Uh, but here we enter into a problematic uh, debate in contemporary uh, uh, legal theory and some forms of political theory namely the deterritorialization of law, or what uh, Günther Teubner and others have called the emergence of global law uh, without uh, a state. If it is in fact the case that sovereignty is being deterritorialized and reconfigured, if we are seeing the emergence of a new form of decentered global law without a state, in what way is this project helpful of cosmopolitanism rather than undermining furthermore all the public institutions of our societies? Why should be at all, why should this be at all a progressive, a progressive uh, move? Is this really, again, uh, not a move that helps uh, the spread of uh, global capitalism and liberal markets rather than of cosmopolitan human uh, rights. Uh, I put forward a strong thesis, uh, this a normative thesis in this context, that in my view, whereas cosmopolitan norms ought to lead to the emergence of generalizable human interests and the articulation of public standards of normative justification, global capitalism, by contrast, and the privatization of law is leading to a segmentation and privatization of interest communities and the weakening of standards of public uh, justification. The, this is the thesis of, I believe, chapter five, the twilight of sovereignty. That is, I'm trying to uh, develop here uh, 
a normative criteria, again, in accordance with the spirit of cosmopolitanism <laughs> to try to distinguish uh, the deterritorialization of law and the transformation of sovereignty from uh, the emergence of cosmopolitan norms and the reconstitution of um, uh, popular uh, sovereignty. As we all know, the boundaries of the political have shifted today beyond the republic housed in the nation state and the deterritorialization of law brings in its wake, therefore, the displacement of the uh, political. And it is clear that only multiple strategies uh, and forms of struggle can reassert the ruptured link between popular consent and the public exercise of power, which is essential to democratic sovereignty and uh, the crucial question, one of the crucial questions for political thought in our times is how to house the idea of popular sovereignty uh, in a framework beyond uh, the uh, territorial state. Uh, I do discuss some reconfigurations of the pol political beyond territoriality in these essays, but uh, this is uh, for future work. I just gesture to them in a number of uh, uh, places. And if you're frustrated, I understand I am as well, but I'm not ready yet uh, uh, to, to try to uh, specify that. It seemed to me to be more important to ask the question uh, than uh, to, to say really uh, what comes next, although we are responsible for saying what comes next. Uh, let me take up one last uh, uh, question, and, um, and that is, um, uh, the concept of the democratic iterations. I'm returning to this concept and some of the challenges uh, involved uh, with it. Uh, this uh, concept uh, was first formulated in the claims of culture and the rights of others over a decade ago. And uh, um, it's generated uh, acceptance as well as criticism uh, and excitement as is, you know, usually, uh, as is often the case. but. Many welcome the epistemological insights behi behind this concept that uh, much moral and political discourse is iterative, ne in the sense never of repetition, and this is a Derridian insight, but in the sense of always expanding the universe of meaning to which our concepts refer by their ever new and contentious deployment. Every iteration involves making sense of quote unquote an original, Strictly speaking, of course, there is no such original. It is rather the iterations, successive iterations, that constitutes the precedent as an original because it continues to be taken as um, uh, authoritative. Uh, in this process, meaning is enhanced and transformed. And uh, this is particularly interesting to me in terms of the iterative potentials of what I call cosmopolitan norms and human rights uh, discourse. One of the first objections to this concept, uh, along with my use of the term Juris Generativity, was made by Bonnie Honig in a series of essays. Uh, Bonnie Honig seemed to think that for me, uh, the iterative process would always and necessarily have to involve a confirmation and acceptance rather than rejection of universalism. Uh, Honig uh, emphasized the dimension of what she called Eurispathy rather than Eurisgenerativity. This term, Eurisgenerativity, uh, comes from Robert uh, Cover, and indeed Robert Cover also talks about Eurispathos and not just Eurisgenerativity. And Bonnie Honig's argument <coughs> against me was that uh, why just assume that democratic iterations are always Eurisgenerativities? Uh, for her, this critique is closely tied to what she sees as the attempt of Habermas, myself, and others to avoid democratic paradoxes and the fundamental indeterminacy of political will. I have learned from Honig's criticism and have responded uh, to her arguments and have engaged with her in several contexts, but I just don't think that there is a teleological philosophy of history behind the concept of democratic iterations. Uh, leading always to the supposed adoption of universalism. I just don't think that there is anything in the construction of this concept uh, that uh, says that at any particular moment, contingent 
discourses and social movements uh, cannot lead um, in a Eurispathic um, uh, dimension. Uh, but I think the, the real difficulty here, and I'm sure many of you who have read the book, you know, that you will want to uh, push me and challenge me on this, and I welcome it, is, is the, the real difficulty is this. As I said, is the concept descriptive or normative? And, uh, uh, and why would one want to use a concept that seems uh, to be clearly neither one uh, nor, the, uh, nor the other? I think uh, the uh, force of the concept is that it uh, compels us to try to focus more concretely on forms of political conversation and struggle uh, through which uh, the iterations of norms unexpectedly give rise to transformative meanings. That is what I have my eye on. And that's why, in many cases, I have written about the, the scarf affair, because I am fascinated by the way in which uh, this affair becomes a lighting road, not only for the sort of uh, cultural, uh, political, theological struggle between you know, Islam and so-called uh, the West, but the way in which the language of civil rights, of freedom of religion, freedom of expression, which we all think we know, is being challenged and confused as a result of what should seem, would seem, in many contexts, an expression of religious faith, religious piety. Um, uh, the, the way in which um, uh, the emergence of new socio-political actors transforms the meaning or forces the meaning of rights, meanings that we take for granted. We all know that we, we think we know what freedom of religious expression is or manifestation of religion is, but nonetheless, we find ourselves, as Gordon Brown had done a while back, beginning to make certain distinctions. Well, this is okay, but you know the burqa is not really part of a religious act, but it is part of a civil, and it's more ethnocentric. I think these conversations are fine, but what is fascinating is why we are so preoccupied, okay, at the beginning of the 21st century with this kind of conversation and trying to fix and signify once and for all the meaning of an act, the meaning of an item of clothing. Well. The answer may be that what is undergoing here is also an iterative transformation on the part of the individuals who are carrying out these acts themselves. So that, in effect, uh, what's always interested me is uh, uh, not only the sort of the hegemonic discourse, or the, the discourse of the, if you read the European Court of Human Rights decisions on this, like lately I was working on the Nejla Akele case, and the distinctions that the court is trying to make uh, between varieties and manifestations of this item of clothing is really you know, quite fascinating to see also the way in which the individuals about whom these decisions are being made, and namely women who are once more you know, the kind of the civilizational uh, soccer ball uh, in, in this complex conversation, are themselves undergoing transformation. So in that sense, I think the concept has a purchase. And it is important that it remain um, uh, sensitive to an open and moored in uh, uh, sort of um, uh, institutional cultural uh, reality. Now, uh, where does the difficulty arise? And uh, permit me to, to think this through with you, um, uh, uh, because it is, um, uh, uh, it, it is a question that uh, continues to, pre, uh, to preoccupy me. Now, the postmodernist philosopher or the Derridian philosopher will say, uh, OK, democratic iterations are good, but you still want to distinguish uh, somehow uh, democratic iterations and practical discourses or discourse ethics. Um, why not give up the Habermasian program altogether? Why, does the, why is there this insistence throughout so many of the you know, essays? And I mean, why do you still want to remain with this form of universalism, uh, rather than just accept that the line between uh, 
sheer manipulation and demagogics uh, between conversation and consternation, uh, between obfuscation and clarification, what these lines are fluid, yes. But nevertheless, nevertheless, I wish to maintain that we have to hold on uh, to the core ideal of a discourse uh, uh, ethic in a minimal way. Let me try to explain uh, what I'm getting at here. If conversations which contribute to democratic iterations are not carried out by the most inclusive participation of all those whose interests are affected, and yes, there is a big discussion about how to talk about that, but if these conversations and deliberations do not permit the questioning of the conversational agenda, do not guarantee the equality of participation, okay? three conditions, inclusiveness, equality, self-reflexivity, then the iterative process is exclusionary, unfair, and illegitimate. This is a very strong claim. But I'm happy to try to make this claim because um, uh, in the absence of uh, some kind of standards of normative justification, uh, the critical theorist uh, can no longer really evaluate the conversations of the present with respect to some anticipated utopian future. I am not happy just to keep playing the game of deconstructing every positive normative uh, ideal, though of course uh, some of these lines are always, you know, are always tenuous and difficult to, to maintain. Now, the uh, challenge about the ideals of uh, practical discourses whose justification goes back to the project of universalism uh, is uh, that uh, I wish to understand them in a, in a negative way. Uh, and uh, here I'm aided by an insight of Reiner Forst, that is, Understand this criteria as giving you a veto power. Right? If in a conversation those whose interests are most affected have been excluded, you can always say, but I have not had a chance, we have not had it. That gives you a moral veto power. Right? It's a way in which it forces you to open the conversation. If you can raise objections to the inequality of the speech situation, this then gives you a veto power. And if self-reflexivity is blocked, <coughs> in other words, that the way in which the rules are set up are such that um, uh, in any given situation, you know, you may not be able to challenge the logic of the forum, again, you have a quasi-veto power. Now, if one is so ambitious with these criteria, it's very clear that a lot of representative parliamentary institutions, courts, etc are not going to be exactly models of practical discourses. And people seem to think this is a problem. No, it is not a problem. It is not a problem because uh, the task of this kind of critical utopian thinking, which is really uh, a, in the service of a sort of what I, I call democratic hope and openness, is not to give you an institutional theory, it is to give you some sensitive criteria whereby you can also critique the institutions. The task of the translation of practical discourses into a theory of institutions is a different task. And maybe one that you know, should be, should be under, undertaken, um, and I'm sure it should be uh, effectively undertaken. But I just want to uh, then um, emphasize uh, one more time uh, the necessity, of, in my view, of holding on to the normative kernel of uh, the universalist project, uh, without which I believe uh, that the task uh, of um, a critical theory uh, is not uh, uh, possible. So let me say just in uh, conclusion, though I know there will be time for concluding this, uh, this okay. afternoon, that I began uh, by situating this collection of essays at a particular historical philosophical moment, beginning with the so-called global war on terror and ending with uh, what I call in the last pages of the book, the dystopias of a militarized hegemon on the one hand and the near collapse of the cosmopolitan 
promises of the European project on the other. I don't, I don't think so. But uh, just in conclusion, I want to say that I wrote, I write these essays in a spirit of democratic hope, a phrase of John Dewey's, which I really love. And at a time when so many of the fundamental institutions in our society, from the free press to the so-called you know, uh, markets, the church, uh, the parliament, seem to be caught in such crises. I think it is um, important to, um, to insist on uh, democratic uh, hope. So thank you all. Well, uh, we've got a whole day of questions on different aspects of this, but um, uh, we've got sort of 15 minutes for some questions now. So. Okay, so I just have a question of clarification on the notion of democratic iterations, and just to see whether I got it right. So the notion is two-dimensional in the sense that it has a descriptive dimension and a more normative dimension. And maybe the descriptive dimension is the iteration bit. And it's about how within discourses and conversation, meaning evolves. So the, the same things within political discourse somewhat change their meanings. And this, to me, rings of the idea of essentially contested concepts. It seems to be sort of a byproduct of essential contestability that we have this evolution of meaning. And the democratic part seems to be the normative part that says, the meaning that emerges out of the discourse is only, in a way, legitimate. I don't know whether that's the, the, the right word. If the discourse is characterized by inclusiveness, equality, and self-reflexivity. Is, is that roughly yes. the picture? Yes. OK, yes. So, so, so that I get a sense. And so there's, there's a, <laughs> so, so that I get a sense yes, of, OK. Yeah, well, yeah, yes. And of course, the difficult question is going to be, and I can just yeah, what the, the, real, the difficult question is whether uh, those criteria are, they're necessary, never sufficient, can be well enough deployed, intelligibly deployed, and whether they will be sufficient for legitimacy. It's so going you're to not be, sure whether they're sufficient for legitimacy? No, they're necessary, but not sufficient. Oh, oh okay. No. Uh, I see. Oh, <laughs> Oliver. <laughs> discourse criteria uh, to a theory of institutions that will always you know, function within certain kinds of constraints, constraints of uh, time, uh, space, scarcity. And particularly if you, uh, you know, take uh, 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 courts all over, this, is, this becomes, you know, this becomes uh, quite inadequate. There are other ways of mediating between practical and legal discourses, as we know that. I mean, it's not as if there's no conversation between the theory of practical discourses and legal discourses. What I meant was that, um, at least in this book, I, I'm not claiming to have developed an 
normative or analytical theory of institutions, but you know, uh, because I do critical theory, one side of me is engaged with institutions socially and historically, right? So I want to make this distinction, right? I mean, there is the question of can you develop a theory of institutions, uh, normative, analytical, whatever, but the other is, you know, do you engage, can you engage with institutions? And I always do. And I always do, you know, it's just like much of the, as you know from, you know, the, the work that I've done looking at courts and so on, uh, that, um, uh, you know, I take that very, I take that very seriously. It is just that sometimes the institutionalist critique, um, or let me put it this way, John Fair John, for example, you know, the institutionalist objection to Habermas's discourse theory is thought to stop that theory at its track. It's a misunderstanding. It doesn't. There are different levels at which the theory is proceeding. Because you see, if you just have an institutionalist theory, yes, of course, the courts operate under constraints. Yes, of course, the parliaments operate under constraints. Where, what critical purchase then do we, do we have? So that's, that's where I'm at. But I don't, I don't dismiss institutions. You know, it's just that a discourse theory is not a normative theory of institutions. Oh, yeah. I'm just wondering, in terms of the history of ideas, what is your feeling about the concept that C. Wright Mills, the American who left out of participatory democracy? In some ways, but when I read these I mean, about the democratic iterations, there seems to be some you know, echo there of the concept of participatory democracy. And the other thing I'd like to say about uh, Bonnie Honig, I mean, in a way also, as I understand her read, when I read her, in a way, this is almost the narcissism of small differences, as far as I can make out. I might be wrong, but um, you know, if I was going to classify her with a mouthful, it would be something like a libertarian, social democratic cosmopolitan, and I don't see this that far away from that. You know, so uh, maybe I've, I've missed something, but yeah. Um, <laughs> let me say something about the second first. Narcissism or small differences, maybe. Yeah. Um, we're obviously very uh, uh, close enough, no, but, but there is there is something else, and I don't mean to just um, single out Bonnie. It's just that I think that you know her work has had the most, to me, challenging and interesting engagement from a deconstructivist perspective uh, with uh, my tradition rather than a, a dismissal of it, mm. you know, which we find, you know, people don't read carefully anymore these days, and nobody believes. Or, no, I shouldn't say this, I'm sorry, I'll take this back. <laughs> but the, the interesting thing about Bonnie's um, uh, critique, and from which, you know, as I said, I have learned, is that um, uh, she seems to think that the way, at least, I've used this concept of iterations seem to imply a kind of philosophy of history mm -hmm. and a necessary convergence of what she calls reason and will that somehow that the political cannot frustrate and reject universalist uh, uh, norms. I think, that's a, I think that's a legitimate criticism. It's something that you know, made, me, made me stop in my tracks at first and, you know, and you know, uh, think about it. Uh, and so I find it important to be able to you know, respond to it. And uh, the, uh, the question then of the use of normative criteria you know, and whether they are always, you know, imbricated in power, right? I mean, the classical objection, Foucauldian objection to discourse theory is also important. About uh, democratic um, uh, iterations and participatory democracy, uh, yes, uh, but probably this goes back to uh, Oliver's question as well. I am not an opponent of representative, you know, democratic institutions. I'm really in this book very much operating with a public model, civil society model of representative as well as participatory multiplicity of institutions. It's just my eye is on a particular process. It's limited. It's no, so I, I don't really see this as juxtapositions. I mean, yeah. uh, Well, even if I could just say one thing, you know, if you think about the American civil rights movement, which is the basis of all the social movement theorizing, you know, the so-called beloved communities of civil rights participants in the American South are interacting with the federal government, and the federal government itself is thinking about the effect of segregation on the Cold War in Africa. So 
it isn't as if they weren't actually, even though the people at the grassroots were somehow criticizing representative democracy, the end result of it was just getting people to vote. But, so it's a tension, isn't it? It isn't that different, I don't think. Uh, Um, so regarding, again, democratic iterations, um, as far as I can understand, it's at least an act of the description of and contestation, and as you said, of the vocabulary, um, the normative vocabulary, and the boundaries of the community of justification. And I was wondering if the criteria that legitimate the democratic iterations are themselves um, subjected to democratic iterations? So it might be a, a weird question, but inclusiveness, equality, self-aggressivity, these ideas in, them, in themselves have been redescribed, challenged, contested. So in, in what sense are these normative criteria outside of the game of redescription? They are not. They are not. No, that's an excellent observation. They are not. And uh, it is fundamental that they should not be. Um, and uh, here's, the, here's the dilemma. Uh, uh, this uh, really goes back to some, you know, uh, to the question of uh, foundationalism in practical philosophy. Um, I um, operate with a what I would call um, a, also some insights from hermeneutics, uh, Gadamerian hermeneutics, that is that in any conversation about practical norms, we are always already in midstream. That is, in discourses, we always already presuppose precisely this contested understanding of all these uh, uh, terms. Um, uh, and these terms themselves then get reposited or recursively elucidated within the conversation, within the conversation itself. Um, a, there is no escape from this. I mean, some critics say, well, all this is circular. I don't think it is circular. It is not. It is not a vicious circle. Uh, we have one meaning of equality in our constitutions, but our whole political uh, life and game is about contesting that meaning of equality and redescribing it. Right? Does it involve, you know, um, same-sex marriage? Does it involve, you know, um, aid uh, to families with dependent children? We know roughly what this norm equality means, but. We are in the process of uh, then um, a, a, a iterating it and, and uh, re, uh, re-signifying it then. But if this is so, uh, are there then any, uh, any criteria? Um, well, I think that criteria are themselves always subject to recursive validation. But this does not mean that we are at a sea without, without anything. You know, Willard van Orman Quine, you know, this famous a metaphor of the boat, you know, that you can only throw up one plank at a time. If you try to throw everything, you know, you you sink. But so um, uh, this is the logic, you know, of the discourse. Now, we we still have a task and obligation as far as possible to try to clarify these concepts. And we now we as depending on what hat you're wearing. I mean, if you're wearing the hat of a moral and political philosopher, like, like say, James Griffin, his monumental work on human rights, which is very uh, helpful, you can offer to the political actors your own particular understanding and elucidation of human rights. Or if you're doing the kind of critical uh, theory that I'm trying to do in this book, you can try to drive a wedge in the inconsistencies around uh, the understanding of these concepts, such as to sort of open up the space of discourse. Uh, uh, But um, uh, yes, they are not outside the conversation. You've you've, um, tried to defend the normativity of uh, discourse ethics and critical theory in relation to various postmodernists and Kantian critiques. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about where you locate 
the difference between discourse ethics and kind of Rawlsian liberalism. The standard account is the three theories have a different way of thinking, different roles. The role of the political actor, the role of the social critic, and the role of the philosopher. Now, the way I understand discourse ethics basically leave, leave it to political actors to negotiate and deliberate over the norms that should govern their interaction through what you call democratic iteration. And then the philosopher really acts as a social critic, trying to identify the kind of benchmark and inclusivity, the kind of conditions under which democratic deliberation is legitimate. So in other words, there is more role for political actors, more role for the social critic, and less role for the philosopher, the normative philosopher. Is that a fair account? I suspect it's not, but can you tell me where it goes wrong? Well, it's, a, it's a very um, fascinating and uh, sort of class. Cecile, right? Yeah. It's just nice to meet you again. Um, um, yes, at one level, I think that that is a very, that is a very fair, um, fair characterization. Um, uh, but I think that uh, one should not assume that because of the way in which the discourse theory articulates the role of the social critic with respect to, you know, um, the uh, political actors, that this also involves or entails a general rejection of the philosophical project. I think that there is um, a, a, there is a, 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 the the concern, uh, which is also the concern about foundationalism. I mean, that's a different conversation. Um, now, um, would uh, the uh, would the Rawlsian uh, project of uh, elucidation? Well, maybe I, I'll leave that in a, the the foundationalist issue in a bracket. Uh, um, I think that um, as uh, I I sort of see these as complementary and not. Um, uh, antagonistic, and that's why, in a sense, um, um, we have uh, learned so much, and there is also so much, you know, continuing sort of engagement, you know, with uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, the the Rawlsian um, uh, uh, project. I'm not I'm not quite giving you a very good answer at the moment. Maybe this is something about which you know I'd like uh, to think a little bit more in the course of the day and come. And come back to it uh, uh, because um, uh, the uh, question about the role of the philosopher within the critical theory tradition um, opens up so many other dimensions that are not just captured, you know, in this uh, kind of um, interaction between discourse ethics and liberal uh, <laughs> liberal theory. I mean, the whole project of you know. Uh, critique the whole project of Adorno's insights, the whole project of you know utopian anticipatory impulses. But I, I, I'm, I don't quite want to get into that. So maybe um, let's continue this conversation. I'm, um, I'm a little uncertain as to you know as to how to answer you completely. But uh, I hope uh, I hope we can come back to it. Sorry, yeah. Last question. Firstly, is it possible that the process of democratic iterations would alter um, international protection of human rights as understood in international law? So, like, even though international norms would, might be the point at which, it, at which a jurisgenerative process begins, might the process of democratic, uh, of domestic democratic iterations, might that, you know, transform them beyond all recognition? Uh, secondly, international norms as the source of um, the jurist generative process, why should international norms be the source given that they arguably have come into being at the international level um, without kind of following the criteria that you seem to require in order for uh, domestic, <coughs> for the legitimacy of domestic 
and then finally, my own kind of area of research is undocumented immigration, migrants' rights, and all that. So I'm just wondering if the Migrant Workers Convention, it's one of the core, the nine core um, UN conventions, but it hasn't been ratified by you know, any of the EU member states or by the US or Canada. But I'm wondering if that, nonetheless, for you, uh, could be a source of juris generativity. Um, uh, does it have the potential to, to advance the rights of undocumented migrants uh, and maybe even secure you know, secure legal status for them, uh, despite the fact in, in countries such as the EU, the US, Canada, despite the fact it hasn't been ratified by any of these uh, member states? Um, let me not say much about the first right now because it opens up a whole different, I mean the last point uh, convention, but let me address the, uh, the first uh, two points about um, international law and so on because I've been uh, doing some more thinking about this and I think that, uh, you know, you hit a very important point there. First, uh, not all norms emerge as a process, as a jurisgenerative generative process. There's no presumption that they do. Um, but uh, the process of iteration, whether in the courts, whether through social movements, whether through NGOs, can set the Euris generativity uh, into motion. Now, this uh, happens uh, much more than we think is the case. Uh, because um, uh, norms in general, because they are general prescriptive sentences, need to be contextualized to guide action and to be meaningful. You know, this is also you know, Wittgenstein's, uh, a Wittgensteinian point, right? So many of the human rights uh, norms uh, uh, acquire um, a texture through contextualization. Sometimes uh, there is a tension between local contextualization and you know, treaty obligations, but the more interesting cases are emerging um, when, in fact, uh, the local uh, deployment of these norms, let's say, such as norms concerning uh, family violence, you know, norms uh, concerning even indigenous uh, people's rights. I was recently in Chile where they are trying to reinterpret the ILO clause about the indigenous people's rights concerning the rights of the Mapuche Indians. Fantastic conversation that was maybe never intended by the International Labour Organization, but you know, the entire society is mobilizing around this, right? Uh, so the Euris generativity emerges at that level. Now, uh, um, there's a lot of you know, evidence about this. And um, a, what is interesting then, does this local contextual work then have any impact on treaty or the international law itself? And here I want to refer to my colleague Judith Resnick's work from the Yale Law School, where she's trying to develop, in fact, a model for understanding uh, treaty ratification process uh, as a kind of uh, really a dialogue, uh, because uh, usually the model is you know you have these international documents and you have recalcitrant resistant countries that just like, you know, take, you know, I mean, uh, runs, right? Reservations, understanding, derogations. And what she's pointing out to is the way in which uh, sometimes uh, there is also a back and forth between country ratification and countries changing their minds about, you know, about uh, whether or not they should sign up or remove a reservation and so on. I think it's very, very important. This is very neglected. And there is a lot of, let me say this, there is a lot of misunderstanding among you know, progressive people in our world as to how these things function. And because there is a lot of misunderstanding and the assumption is that they are hegemonic, one is not using them as creatively to advance one's struggles as one might. And so this is where the convention on the Migrant Workers Convention, you know, would uh, something like that would uh, 
or would uh, 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 come up, not because it is valid law, it isn't, it hasn't been ratified, right? But it can enable you, you know, to deploy some arguments and uh, some, uh, some criteria. So uh, um, uh, yeah, those are very, very helpful questions. Thank you.